Hi, it's Zoe, and this is episode 40 of the Zoe Rath Leadership Podcast, and today we're talking about entitlement. Is it a plague or opportunity? Let's do this. Welcome to the Zoe Rath Leadership Podcast, your source of strategies and insights to make you a better leader. Influence, improve, inspire. Great to be here. And folks have been asking me about the chooks. I always get chicken questions. <laughs> Still have four of them. My oldest chook, she's nine. It's like amazing. I think it's 90 in chicken years. Her name is Leia, and she's a Plymouth Rock, and she's stripy. She's been at stalwart. She's just been amazing. The only problem she ever had is she got a little bit of a stone stuck in her foot once that got infected. So uh, in the meantime, she's just been an amazing, amazing lady. And she started to hobble around a little bit. So I think at the age of 90, if that's the first time you started to hobble, you're doing all right. So I'm just keeping an eye on her. And she's got this one wonky tail feather, so she looks a bit gimpy. (laughs) But everybody else is healthy and their combs are going red again, which means they're going to start laying eggs, maybe, (laughs) as the spring edges closer. So that's the chook news. I know you're all dying to hear that. In other news, very exciting stuff has been happening at Inner Compass here. We launched last week our first ever retreat, leadership retreat in Tasmania. And uh, I've I've been dying myself to go to Tassie and do some beautiful walking there. It's just spectacular countryside. And we've found a great little eco lodge. It's a brand new facility that will allow us to have a beautiful home base. So all the creature comforts of glamping, where we can then go out and do morning expeditions. So a little bit of hiking, maybe some sea kayaking. And the objective of this is to give us time and space to do the big picture thinking. It's in November, so it's perfectly placed to review the year as well as get set for the new year. And this is the biggest complaint I get from leaders is that they'd never have time to do the big picture thinking and it just eats away at them because they know that's the stuff that's going to give them leverage in their personal lives as well as their professional lives and their businesses. So I've created a time and space and place for leaders to get time out, to do the big picture thinking and just to get centered, recalibrated. There's only eight spots, so it's going to be nice and intimate, high level networking, And if you want to play, it's November 2 to 5 here um, in Australia out of Tassie. We fly into Launceston and off we go. If you want to know more, just email me, zoe at intercompass.com.au. I'm so excited about that one. (laughs) The other news is uh, the next Leaders Edge Mastermind will kick off in February and we're going back to Tassie. So if you missed out on the November opportunity, you can still get a chance to go with us on the Leaders Edge Mastermind. That's my high level leadership program. And you can find that on my site. Just go to zoerouth.com slash mastermind. You'll find the key there. So we've got a couple spots taken already for that program. So if you want to join a cohort of high level leaders for a whole year where you get to develop your leadership thinking, have a group that can be your personal sounding board. This is it. It's one of my favorite programs. The relationships that are being honed in it are amazing and people are getting seriously huge improvements in their leadership thinking, the results they're getting in their businesses. That's all happening. And yesterday, Bianca Jurd, and who is my business manager and I, met to start planning out the Leaders Edge con <clears throat> sorry, the Edge of Leadership Unconference, which is happening the 23rd of March out of Canberra. So we've rejigged it, redesigned it, and we've got a new venue that's going to be perfect, perfect for escaping and for big picture thinking. And the theme will be around employee experience. So stay tuned for the launch of that, and you can get in on the super duper early bird, which will be a massive discount. So that's all happening very shortly. The book that I'm still reading or pondering because it's staying with me is Stephen Scott Johnson's book, Emergent. Now, we did a podcast interview with him a few weeks ago before it actually came out, and then my copies arrived. And it's extraordinary. It's such a sophisticated, layered approach to looking at organizational change and creating a movement or co-creating a movement within an organization. It really is high-level advanced strategic thinking on how to do transformation and impact in a very sophisticated way. So I believe that this is the type of book that you will read through once and go, wow, and then come back to it and then start teasing it out chapter by chapter, looking at the 
the scale of it and that you, how you can implement it bit by bit. So it's all there and it's uh, it's quite a remarkable book. So I encourage you to get that. That's Stephen Scott Johnson's book, Emergent. Yeah. All right. So on to today's topic, entitlement, plague or opportunity. <laughs> It's amazing, right? It's it's quite an interesting topic. What is this sense of entitlement that we're hearing uh, from leaders about their employees? And you know what? It's not just one sector. It's across sectors. I've heard it in the not-for-profit sector with some of my clients there. In private businesses, they complain about it. In the public service, it's rife and rampant. And in higher education, it seems it's happening everywhere, that employees are causing stress and drama for their bosses because they have the sense of, you owe me. Where does that come from? And what's it about? And this is what I've been curious about because the tendency is to blame the people, right? There's obviously something wrong with them. They're obviously not uh, respectful or appreciative of what the business is doing for them. And they're selfish bastards. (laughs) sort of the undertone that can often come up with this because when it's somebody has a sense of an entitlement they're very difficult to deal with they're they sulk they're obstructive they make demands they threaten to leave or maybe they, they do leave so it's a real problem it's not just an attitude thing it has real repercussions for businesses so when I was looking at this there's plenty of stuff written on the sense of entitlement and I'm going to post all these links in the show notes and you'll find the show notes at zoerouth.com slash podcast slash entitlement. And some of them are really amazing. There's this great one called uh, From the Republic of Everyone that looks at the millennials age of entitlement and millennials and Gen Y. There's there's conflicting definitions of when Gen Y started and what's the difference with millennials and stuff. So I think let's just go with an easy broad definition. Millennials slash Gen Y are largely the same group of people and they're currently aged between 20 and early 30s. There's a few ones in their sort of late 30s, but largely that's the generation we're talking about. So they're in the workplace, they've been in the workplace for five to 10 years maybe, and they're looking for growth. They're looking for career progression, et cetera. And what is the age of entitlement? And there's been a lot of theories about it, right? That they were raised by parents who gave them everything, the cotton wool generation or the everyone gets a prize generation where you got ribbons for participation, not just for winning. And this was meant to encourage and boost self-esteem. And the message to these Gen Y kids was you can be, do, or have anything you want. You are amazing and we support you. And it was all through good intentions. So the baby boomer parents who raised these Gen Y kids really put their heart and soul into raising these kids because boomers came out of a time where their parents were came through an even really tougher time through the war, through the depression. And so that ethos of hard work and uh, being wary of circumstances and being risk averse kind of rubbed off and rubbed against the next generation who wanted to give their kids a sense of optimism and proactivity, which they didn't have necessarily growing up. So that was all where it came from. The end result has been interesting to say the least. Tim Urban from Wait But Why wrote a fabulous, fantastic article about uh, Gen Y and why they're disillusioned and depressed. (laughs) And it's because they've had their, their cloud of expectations disappear in front of them. So it's amusing for those of us who are not Gen Y because it pokes fun at Gen Y. And yet it, under, it points to a lot of the failings in terms of how we've set these, these young people up for disappointment. So it's a useful article. And yes, it has little drawings of unicorns and rainbows. Rainbows is worth it just for the cartoon factor. And then, of course, there's more recently Simon Sinek's famous rant that went viral about uh, what's happening with Gen Y. And it's not all their fault. It's the circumstance in which they were raised. So I'll put a link to all that if you haven't seen that or you want to review it, review it. So this is what I also know about that generation, our younger cohorts of peers, is that they have different expectations and understanding of the system. They've seen the system, in quotation marks, do stuff that ain't working so well for all of us. You know, we've got global warming. We've got the GFC. It's seen every system that our, that our generation and the boomers and the builders before them have created. And as a result, the results are not so good. 
And this is what they've been raised to look at and to understand and to have to wrestle with. So Gen Y has been raised as a very globally conscious generation. They get that we're all interconnected and they've lived it because they are technology natives. So they get interconnectivity, they get rapid expansion of ideas and so on. So they have a very different worldview and perspective and understanding and way of engaging with the world that hasn't existed before. So they are very savvy. They are very broad in their worldview. They often believe in meritocracy and not hierarchy. And I think that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks we have with this sense of entitlement is that they believe that if they can demonstrate competency, they should be awarded and recognized appropriately. Whereas Gen X, that's my generation, and the older generations, that hasn't always been the case. That's not the context in which we grew up. It was not necessarily about uh, meritocracy um, and being able to demonstrate competency. It's more about the privilege of experience, and experience was the thing that was rewarded. And that only came through time and effort and diligence and loyalty. For Gen Ys, it's no, it, it, that doesn't make sense. That seems like a huge waste of time. <laughs> because if you can do it, why not do it now? And if I can do it well now, why do I have to wait five years to prove that I can do it? And in some sense of the word, they're completely correct. If they can do a job, why not pay them appropriately to compensate for getting the job done? In some senses of the word, they're not correct. And that was Simon Sinek's point in many of the things I've seen him say and listen to is that there is value in experience. There, there's value in adapti- adaptability. And yet wisdom comes through experience and context and reflection. And you can't just sort of take a injection of that necessarily. So there's a bit of a balance between the two. So there's a little bit of conflict of worldview that creates this tension between expectations. And that's sort of one of the sources of what's at play when we come to look at expectation. Really, what it boils down to and how we define it is that we have this sense of entitlement when we feel as individuals that our effort is not equal to the reward, is not equal to the reward that we're getting. That's the sum total of it. So what is underpinning that? Why do we believe as individuals that our effort is not being recognized and appreciated? I believe that it's not just a generational worldview challenge. It's some survival triggers are being being pressed in the workplace. So what I mean by that, if you look at the work of David Rock and other neuroscientists, contemporary survival triggers in the workplace include things like uh, a sense of fairness, a sense of autonomy, and status. So let's just tease those out a little bit. Fairness is when we perceive that we are getting our fair share of the pie. In tribal terms, this was really important because it kept the harmony in the tribe. If we all got a fair share, we knew that we were all going to survive together. If somebody got more than their fair share, the balance, the equilibrium, the fine-tuned web of relationships gets out of kilter. In contemporary organizations, how I see this play out is when people perceive that personality and not performance are being rewarded. This is a pretty critical distinction because our sense of fairness is if I perform, I get rewarded. And what people perceive is that it's preference and priority and privilege that comes from personality and relationships. That's what's unfair. It doesn't make sense that somebody gets rewarded for that instead of the things that they do. Sometimes it's um, fairness going the other way. Someone is punished unfairly for performance that wasn't their responsibility or for a system that was out of whack. So this sense of scale or balancing the scales is pretty fundamental to all of us. And that can trigger a sense of entitlement too. If we see that happening in the workplace, it means that it's an unsafe workplace. And so we strive to protect ourselves by tipping the balances more in our favor again. So that's one driver. Autonomy as a threat, as a survival threat in the workplace means, am I in charge of my own destiny? And if not, that can rattle my cage and that can give me, cause me to have a request for, for more reward, because that gives me a sense of um, autonomy back again. And if that doesn't happen, then that can push us into indignant rebellion or mutiny or jumping ship. (laughs) So the way that this plays out is the way that I'm seeing it play out in organizations. If people feel their fairness buttons are being, um, 
oppressed in terms of they've asked for a pay rise, that sort of sense of entitlement, and it's been denied to them, or they've asked for a title change, or they've asked for a better desk space, or whatever it is, and they don't get it, that is both a trigger of, of fairness and a trigger of autonomy, which means like, hang on a minute, I don't have control of my own destiny here. I've made a request. It's not being fulfilled. I feel suppressed. <laughs> and I'm, I'm deliberately making that very simplified. And yet that's sort of how we tend to feel. It's like, oh, I've hit a ceiling here. So what I've been seeing is that the millennials, the Gen Ys are saying, well, screw this. I'm going to go out on my own. And there has been a significant number of young female employees in particular jumping ship because they're not getting, they're not creating, or they're not getting access to the lifestyle, the rewards, and the structures that they want in order to feel successful, independent, and autonomous. So I've seen a lot of lawyers in particular leave different organizations to set up their own firms. And technology and the systems these days make that super easy because you don't need a massive office. You can do co-working space. You can have a virtual office. You can meet clients out. You don't need to have the trappings of an institution to back you as a lawyer because it is all based on merit and performance, not necessarily on reputation. There's lots of downsides, of course, to striking out on your own, and a lot of these younger employees will find that. It's sometimes helpful to have a bigger organization to back you up and so on. So autonomy can sort of tip the sense of entitlement as well. And status is a big one, and that's a deep ingrained human driver. So our sense of who we are can come from our expertise. And when that gets challenged, that can put us into survival mode because it challenges our sense of identity. So an example of that, uh, recently I heard of an organization and they promoted a lot of their Gen Ys and gave them new titles and gave them all pay rises. Great! (laughs) It sounds like entitlement problem solved. And it didn't. Some people who got more money wanted even more money. And some people who got new titles wanted the titles of somebody else because they felt that their title should have been different. What it, why? Why is this all a problem? So the employer thought they were helping by giving recognition through status and through financial reward. And yet there was something else missing. So the status differential and the titles pushed that whole fairness button. And the pay differential, well, that's signs of something even bigger than just entitlement. So underneath the surface of that complaint is a leadership problem. And the leadership problem that's uh, on display here with this is that it's the concept that an organization has is a hierarchy and is run by the leader at the top, who's a stalwart, who's in command. That whole command, control, and hierarchy, and the white knight as leader who has all the solutions and dictates the vision, that, my friends, is gone. That doesn't work. It doesn't work in a connected, collaborative world. And this is what's really one of the problems that drives a sense of entitlement, is that our Gen Y colleagues know this. They can see right through. They can see that they can have something to contribute, and they genuinely do. They have been digital natives. They are very flexible and adaptable. They can learn a lot more, or have learned a lot more quickly than the generation that I did growing up because of access to technology. So they actually probably know more, and they know how to learn more quickly. So why would you downplay that or not invite that to the table to help the organization adapt? This is what I see as one of the biggest leadership challenges out there for workplaces, is that they are using an outdated leadership and organizational system and trying to keep people happy in it. So what is the alternative? The alternative is to educate folks on the existing system and invite them to develop the system together. So it's not saying this is the way we do it, either adapt or get out because you'll end up having people leave in droves or mutiny or whatever it is, or just plain whinge, which is not, none of those things are pleasant. So how do you invite people to see the system and to play in the system? It means you as a leader needs to, needs, 
need to consciously evolve your own leadership thinking. You need to be able to see your organization as a complex people living system and be able to map the dynamics in it and to see where the flows and friction points are in it. So you as a leader need to upgrade your thinking significantly in order to educate others and invite them to play and design the system in collaboration with you. It's not like you design the system and that's it. It's more like, let's map it. Let's see how it works. Let's see where it doesn't work. And let's build this together and keep adapting to it. And that's the other big context piece that leaders aren't necessarily aware of is that our context is changing so quickly and rapidly. We need to be responsive to that and not on the back foot all the time with it. So here are a couple solutions to help deal with the entitlement issue. The first thing is perspective. Understand people's perspective. Dig underneath about what the key drivers are, what the survival threats are, and see if there's not a way of adjusting the system and their role in it to help alleviate some of that stuff. The next step is accountability and transparency. And that means starting with you as the leader is creating an awareness of what's happening in the organization how you are accountable for different things and how other people are accountable for different things and make that all visible and accessible for folks. There's lots of parameters around that. However, I challenge you to think about how your accountability and transparency is happening now and see if you couldn't make it more open in order to invite collaboration and collaborative solutions to make it even better. Appreciation is another key touch point that you can use to help folks... uh, decompress or um, smooth over this sense of uh, entitlement. I think appreciation, when that's lacking, tips people over the edge into the sense of entitlement. One survey I read, and I'll post a link to that. I think I have a link to that one. I'll, I'll see if I can find that article and pop it in the show notes as well. It did a bunch of research, and this is one of the interesting statistics I've had, is that most people feel they're not getting enough appreciation at work. And they said, well, how often is enough? Some people said never, they don't care. Uh, Some people said once a year. Some people said uh, once a month, and some people said daily. (laughs) So, and what was the biggest category? It was not daily, by the way. It was monthly. That was the significant rate at which people were hoping and expecting and would welcome a sense of appreciation. Now, that means appreciation in all types of different forms, from a simple thank you to a pat on the back to public recognition. It's different for everybody. And that's what you need to find out as a leader is what's meaningful to the individuals in your team. The point is, how often are you going out of your way to appreciate people? Is it built into your systems? Is it unexpected and unexpected? Is it formal and informal? I reckon as leaders, we can do much, much better with this. Three other points that you can do in terms of helping to deal with this entitlement issue. Growth. Lots been written by uh, Dan Pink on the subject in his book Drive, and this, and as well as from Dr. Jason Fox's books um, Game Changer is the one I'm thinking of, where he talks about how to design work that engages people. This sense of growth and progress is really critical. How do you set that up? Have you got it set up? Do people feel like they're learning and growing? If not, forget it. There's plenty of other opportunity for them to go elsewhere. So that's a pretty big one. And the last piece is around belonging. How do you create a sense of tribe? This is pretty critical because people can choose new, new tribes easily. They can go online and find a whole community that can support them and encourage them and where they can feel united. If you don't create a sense of belonging and purpose and unity in your business, it's just a pragmatic functional thing. And I tell you what, we are all hungry for more meaning in our lives. So this is one of your most important responsibilities as a leader is to foster that, is to create a place where people feel like they belong and it has meaning. If you don't feel that yourself, you get in trouble. So key points again, one, perspective, two, accountability and transparency, three, appreciation, four, growth, five, belonging. Okay. Simple. Not easy, lots of good work to be done around that, and it takes constant dedication. I would love to hear your comments on that. Uh, send me an email, zoe at intercompass.com.au, with your questions and your comments and your experience around employee engagement, in particular, this whole issue of entitlement. In the meantime, lead well, live well. <laughs>